I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. As more people return to work and in-person gatherings, medical officials are concerned that this could be a big flu season. More on that and the latest on the COVID Delta variant tonight. UMD Theater hosts the world premiere of Maxa, the maddest woman in the world, next week. We will talk with the creators of the horror musical. And we'll hear from KAXE Radio News Director Heidi Holton from Grand Rapids in Voices of the Region. These stories and more are coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, despite the shorter days, we're still enjoying some above average temperatures. Above average temperatures, a little bit dreary today, but still It's going to be a wet feeling, weekend around here. Still feeling pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. All right, let's start with the headlines. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Duluth Mayor Emily Larson announced plans to implement a housing trust fund to provide more affordable housing in the city. The mayor said the city would provide $4 million to the fund and local initiative support corporation or LISC would contribute $2 million. The creation of the housing trust fund will be brought to the city council as an ordinance at its next meeting. Wisconsin's People's Maps Commission has released its proposals for redrawing the Badger State's election districts. The nonpartisan commission was created by Governor Tony Evers to draw fair boundaries following the 2020 census. Wisconsin's Republican-controlled legislature has indicated they prefer to keep the districts mostly as they are with just some minor changes. Visit Duluth President and CEO Anna Tansky has been honored for her contributions to Minnesota's tourism industry. Tansky received the Roger Toussaint Award at the Minnesota Association of Convention and Visitors Bureau annual meeting this week. The association praised Tansky for her 30-year career and leading a team that has made Duluth a top tourism destination, welcoming nearly 7 million visitors a year with an economic impact of $1 billion. With COVID cases surging in the region, additional free saliva testing sites are opening out of the public. St. Louis County has added sites in Eveleth and Virginia, and the test site at the deck in Duluth has expanded to accommodate up to 1,000 people per day. In Wisconsin, the Department of Health announced this week it is relaunching its pilot program to increase COVID testing capacity. Despite the recent wave of COVID cases spurred by the Delta variant, people are once again gathering for events and students are back in the classrooms. Medical officials say that while folks have protection against COVID on their minds, they should also get their annual flu shot. Joining us to talk about these issues is Dr. Andrew Thompson with St. Luke's Infectious Disease Associates. And doctor, thank you so much for joining us again. You've been a, a great guest over throughout the COVID pandemic and uh, Let's talk about the flu though, uh, because it seemed like last year the, the flu, the seasonal flu all but disappeared, um, but now you're expecting perhaps a resurgence. Yeah, last year was remarkable mm -hmm. in that we saw almost no influenza mm -hmm. globally, um, but I would never underestimate flu mm -hmm. and we have to anticipate that we will see increased flu activity this year, in part because people are gathering more, as you mentioned, uh, we're not masking continually, and uh, uh, there's just more contact, more opportunity for that virus to spread. Is there any indication what the flu season will be like? Is this going to be an exceptionally severe case of flu? We never know. We don't know ahead of, of time. Uh, sometimes we can look to the southern hemisphere to give us some clues, but I think the past year or two has been so unusual that it's really impossible to mm. predict. Mm -hmm. What about children and the flu shot? Because a lot of children are not yet eligible to get the COVID vaccine. Should flu be top of mind for, for those families with young children? Yes, it should, because flu can be very severe in young children, especially those under five. Mm -hmm. And so everyone over six months of age it, uh, should get a flu shot or is appropriate to get a flu shot. Mm -hmm. So children uh, are a, a big focus there. Do flu shots interact at all with the COVID vaccines? No, there's no interaction between COVID vaccine and a flu shot. And in fact, you can get them together on the same day. Mm -hmm. um, flu shots reformulated every year kind of based on what the 
the dominant strain is. Is there any potential to, to maybe at some point kind of wrap the COVID-19 vaccine in with the flu shot because it, it's similar to a flu? Yeah, I mean, they're very different viruses, uh -huh. although they are respiratory viruses. Um, and I think, you know, some thought has gone into that, a combo vaccine, like we have for a lot of pediatric sure. vaccines, yep. you know, you can get five or six into one. So that, that may be a possibility soon. Mm -hmm. Is there still a COVID surge here in the Northland, doctor? What's that all about? Absolutely, there is. Over the past few weeks in Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, North Dakota, we've seen a significant increase in cases and in hospitalizations. So though nationwide the numbers might be falling, we have seen them increasing significantly in recent weeks. Are we starting to get a handle on it now or not quite? Uh, I think it's too early to say that. Um, we, I'm hoping we have plateaued, but I would expect over the next few weeks to see more cases actually. Generally speaking, are the folks who are winding up in the hospital with COVID, are they still that population with underlying conditions? Um, some are, mm -hmm. but not all. There are some people who have no underlying health conditions who get se severely ill, um, end up on ventilators. Mm -hmm. Do you have any therapeutics that you're using when, when people come in? Yeah, and we know more, a lot more than we did 18 months ago. Um, we have antivirals, we have um, anti-inflammatories that we use, um, and if people come in early, we have monoclonal antibodies, which are seeing increasing use now. Oh, yeah. One in 500 Americans have died of COVID. So why is there so much angst, do you think, amongst those who simply will not get the COVID vaccine? I wish I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I think uh, in some ways it's been politicized. Um, it really is a, 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 an incredibly effective public health intervention. And I think we should all view it that way as a way to protect ourselves and our neighbors and our family. Um, so hopefully we can get there. Mm -hmm. There were more than two dozen St. Luke's employees who resigned over the mandate that uh, all employees get the vaccine. Were they folks uh, in frontline care? Um, I, you know, I don't know details, I, but I know that there were a few people in various roles, um, mm -hmm. some not in, in clinical roles who uh, may have resigned due to that. Mm -hmm. Has it resulted at all in any sort of a, a staffing shortage? Um? You know, we've had staffing shortages for months. Um, and so it, it, it has slightly, but I think um, th that's not the cause of our current staffing shortage and statewide, nationwide, um, we are seeing significant healthcare staffing shortages. It sounds like Pfizer may soon be able to get the green light to go ahead and vaccinate younger people. Can you address that a little bit? Yeah, uh, they will be, the FDA will be meeting at the end of the month and then the CDC group meets in early November to review the pediatric data for those ages five to 11. Um, and some of that data isn't available yet. Um, but based on their application, it sounds like they have good data for safety and effectiveness. And so I'm hopeful that, that a thorough review of the data shows that, it, that that's true and they approve it. Could the inoculation then of children as young as that actually uh, maybe bring an end to the COVID problem well, a lot earlier than maybe we anticipated? Right, in recent weeks, young people have really been driving a lot of the new cases. So if we could prevent that transmission among young people and prevent them from getting sick and ending up in the hospital, that would really be important. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll reach a point though, you know, now that this is kind of out of the box, it's not just in the United States, it's global. Um, is there ever really going to be a time when, when we can completely get rid of COVID or do we just have to accept that it's here to stay? Yeah, we'll probably not be rid of it. I would mm -hmm. consider it endemic. So something that's going to be around. There are other coronaviruses that cause colds every year. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is that we get enough population immunity that it is more of a nuisance than a, you know, a significant yeah. health threat that kills mm -hmm. a lot of people. Something as simple as masks, do they work? Are they helping? Yes. They help. They're, we don't have anything that's perfect. The vaccine isn't perfect. Masks aren't perfect. But if masks work to reduce 40% of transmission, that's far better than mm -hmm. nothing. And so I think adding all of these things together it's, is what is going to stop the pandemic. All right. Well, Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for coming in and visiting with us, sharing some insights, and good luck as you go forward. Thank you. Thank you Glad very much. Here.
The University of Minnesota Duluth Theater Department hosts the world premiere of Maxa, the Maddest Woman in the World, next week. Described as a horror musical, the production relates the story of Paula Maxa, a famed French actress who died on stage thousands of times in her career. Here's more on that production. The musical is Maxa, the Maddest Woman in the World. It's a horror musical, and it was written by our wonderful faculty member, Thomas Jacobson, with his playwright partner in crime, Mika Kaufman. And it's about Paula Maxa, who was a great French actress in the early 1900s. She worked at the Grand Guignol, which was a theater of horror and torture. And essentially, she's the actress who has died the most times on stage. They come here for a show so they can feel something, something in their insignificant lives. And night after night after night, they watch me die. I play young Paula. I'm a student here, and I'm a senior BFA acting major. All, her life literally led her to this stage and she used every traumatic event, every experience in her life to mold her as that amazing actress. A lot of the themes is surviving forgiveness, trusting in yourself, and not letting that anger, possibly even hatred towards yourself, stop you from growing as a person. I am the stage manager for Maxa. This is my first stage management role. It's very new and unique, especially given that it was written by one of our faculty members and that we have the opportunity to fully produce it before it ventures elsewhere. So we are following COVID protocols on campus with the mask mandates, but when we transition to rehearsing on the stage and during performances, we will be unmasked. Audience members will have to wear masks. This is the first time that we're doing something inside the theater post-COVID. And now we're taking that, that next step to get back to where we were by getting the audience into the seats behind me uh, and the actors on the stage that we're on right now. So some of the themes that Maxa includes that's really important to be on the stage is how it handles survivorship and how we get through and process our trauma and be, we'll learn to become friends with it and move on in our lives with it. Well, especially in 2021, a lot of these things are coming up of the Me Too movement and just being able to speak about these events that go on, such as sexual assault and abuse. It's ultimately a show about surviving and persevering and still being here. Everyone who's acting in it is a student here at UMD. There's quite a few students who are student designers. Personally, like just being in the room, in a rehearsal room, and it's my favorite part of being a director is to just be in the space when other people are doing what they're you know, most gifted at. And so when we invite audiences into here to listen to a story, uh, to watch a story for the first time in a long time with other people, I think it'll mean a lot. Joining us now are the creators of the musical. Mika Kaufman wrote the book and the lyrics of Maxa, and Thomas Jacobson is the composer <laughs> of the music. And welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Mika, we'll start with you. What was your inspiration for this production? How did you come up with the idea? Oh my goodness, it's actually this one that came up with the idea. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Uh, Thomas uh, had presented it to me. Do you want to? Do you want to? Sure. Yeah, I, I was going down a little rabbit hole of research on theater. I had watched a TV show called Penny Dreadful, and a segment of that show takes place at the Grand Guignol Theater. Granted, one in London, not the Parisian one that ours is focused at, but being a huge lover of horror, I was really drawn to this and the, really into the fact this is the first time horror was ever performed. And so I just started researching the theater, and you, you can't get very far researching the Grand Guignol until you come across the name Paula Maxa. Mm -hmm. And when I came across her and learned about her story, I just asked myself, maybe, you know, do we have a musical here? So I pitched it to Mika to and see I what And I said, yes! <laughs> we started writing it. Yes. Well, maybe give us the, the short course on her story. Oh, sure. So. Um, in terms of in terms of the musical itself, um, so this is a story of survivorship, 
It's about uh, Paula Maxa, the Grand Guignol. She was a famous French tragedian. Uh, her scream was known throughout all of Paris. And, uh, which is funny, it's a musical with a lot of screaming. A lot of screaming. <laughs> and uh, her story is really just, it's, it's really, dives deep into sort of the intersection between trauma and healing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a lot of deep diving into that and survivorship. Yeah. That is the most important part of the musical for us. So how mm -hmm. have the students and crew been to work with on this at UMD? They I'm so fantastic. proud of them. They're so fantastic. <laughs> really? Yes. It is an insanely talented group of students. That's good to hear. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, the, there is a content advisory for graphic depictions of violence, murder, gore, um, some tough conversations. It's clearly not for everyone. Yes. But who do you see as the primary audience, and what do you want them to take away from it? So I personally see whoever is able to come and see our show as the audience. Um, we dedicate our show to survivors, and as a survivor myself, it's always been extremely important that our show is as accessible as possible to other survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's just not going to be accessible to right. everyone because it is seen through a horror lens as well. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> and on top of that, we do touch on very traumatic topics just based on um, events that had happened in Paula Max's life. And I like, I love using the term content advisory instead of content warning. Content warning is so often used, <laughs> but with an advisory, it just really is letting our audience know, you know, like trauma is not something that is ugly. And it's something that we want to normalize and that we just really want to talk about and want to use as a gesture in a theatrical form mm -hmm. so that it mm -hmm. can be spoken about to is, our audience. Is there any danger that, um, Putting it to music, you know, having it, having violence portrayed in in this sort of a way, kind of glorifies brutality at all. Well, it all depends on how it's presented. Uh -huh. um, it, f for example, in our show, the moments that are very bloody are comical and over the top, highly melodramatic. Mm -hmm. The moments that deal with these issues are we treat as respectfully as possible and they are not shown and they are not gratuitous. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we use a lot of shadow play mm -hmm. because again, that's just something that to me as a survivor is way more accessible in that, in that way. Right. So and what I'm is the creative play. process for the two of you? How do you put this together? <laughs> <laughs> we love working with each other yeah, so yeah. much. <laughs> well, it's, the, I would say the show is probably 80% lyric first mm -hmm. and 20% music first. Generally what happens is Mika will send me a lyric and I will take it and just set it to music. And then there are times when we know the situation we want to tackle, but mm -hmm. we aren't quite sure how to get it going. So sometimes Mika will ask me, hey, could you just throw me maybe 16 bars of something? This is the vibe, <laughs> this is the mood. And yeah, I'll throw 16 bars their way and then that like, kind of sparks a lyric mm -hmm. and then we just it just rolls from there and we really work off of each other's energy as well yes. like we know we have something good going when we're like yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> both, we both have similar backgrounds as directors sure. and performers are, and singers ourselves mm -hmm. so I feel like that really helps our process and the two of you bring energy I can see that right now to the production <laughs> uh, what do you mean so are, are you finding that the, the actors uh, and crew people are also absorbing some of that energy we hope we hope so. <laughs> I can see it. I can yeah. really see it. Um, our room is very special. It is very, very special, especially given the content that we are talking about with these students and that they, they're mm -hmm. the ones who are performing. Uh, and they are handling it so well because we normalize these conversations mm -hmm. around mental right. health and around trauma. Yeah. And we, we give them the, they know that they have the autonomy to come to us with questions, to come with us, to come to us with concerns mm -hmm. and ideas. And they are truly, they're not just actors, they're truly collaborators. I need a quick process. answer. When and where are tickets available and when's the show? They are available at the UMD box office and it opens next Thursday the 14th and runs the 23rd. Okay, very fine. Thank you both for being All here right. tonight. Thank you. Thank you All right, Mika thank and you. Thomas, thank you much. Nice job.
time for this week's edition of Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist in the area about the stories that they're covering. This week, KAXE Radio News Director Heidi Holton from Grand Rapids is our guest. We are continuing to watch and to listen to our communities when it comes to COVID and the impact it's having on healthcare, the variants, um, also on schools. We're learning um, about places like Brainerd, their youth cases have spiked in the last week by 40%. Itasca County Public Health is reporting a 14 day case rate of 74.3 new infections per 10,000 people. Beltrami County is reporting 472 new cases in the last 14 days. So we recently talked to Grand Itasca Clinic and Hospital doctors, Dan Sular and Simon Lick. Here's Dr. Sular. So as a community, we are having uh, very high COVID numbers. Uh, our numbers right now are matching where we were last November during our largest surge. Um, so unfortunately, we, you know, we're there. A common question I get in the clinic often is about the Delta variant. Um, the latest statistic I saw from the state is 99% of all positive COVID cases are from the Delta variant. So essentially that is the COVID strain that's circulating widely through our community. It is very transmissible, which is a little bit different than what we saw last year. It's also why we're seeing so many more cases this time around. Simon Lick is a hospitalist at Grand Itasca. We asked him how the staff are holding up. I would say that the general sentiment is, is because of the volumes and because of the workload and because of uh, the history that's led up to this and, and the prolonged nature of the pandemic, it, 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 it's feeling very unsustainable. We've had a lot of difficulty with uh, staffing in hospitals, both, both here and nationwide. And a lot of it comes down to the nurses who have just continued to show up and continue to work hard and continue to work nights, weekends, and holidays in order to deliver the best care they can. And there, there is just only so much that, that, that people are, are capable of. And going forward, the need to support each other and the need to keep showing up continues, but, but needing a light at the end of the tunnel is, is becoming increasingly more urgent. COVID continues to affect communities, businesses, nonprofits, even events. This year, the Iron Range Pasty Festival that's put on by the Iron Range Partnership for Sustainability had to once again change their plans for this Saturday, October 9th. We struggle with people saying, are you for this or against that? Or, you know, wanting us to take political positions. And you really don't want to do that. We decided that we wanted to do something that brings people together and food brings people together. And we could honor the tradition of the Cornish pasty and the role that it played for miners on the Iron Range without stepping into too much political stuff and just have fun with it. What makes our pasty different is that we make it from all local ingredients. So we have grass-fed beef and pastured pork from Willow Sedge Farms in Palisade. We have potatoes and onions and carrots and rutabagas from Skunk Creek Farms in Meadowland and Elm Creek Farms in Orr. And the Masabi East Environmental Education students grow our fresh thyme. And so we feel like this is a unique pasty because it's all local and you can't get that anywhere else really. The third annual Iron Range Pasty Festival will be virtual again Saturday, October 9th, but there is gonna be some outdoor activities. So drive through, pick up your pre-ordered pasties. Sarah Softich and friends will be performing music and there will be rutabaga bowling, or if you have finished roots like I do, rutabaggy bowling is how you refer to it. <music> William Kent Kruger is a best-selling Minnesota mystery writer. His latest is out, it's called Lightning Strike, and this time it is a prequel. We get to meet main character Cork O'Connor when he is 12 years old. O'Connor is part of Ojibwe, and most of Kruger's books explored that relationship between white and Ojibwe culture. I asked William Kent Kruger about writing about Ojibwe culture as a white man. When I made that decision, I knew about what every white person knows about this culture we live shoulder to shoulder with, which is nothing. 
but I was a cultural anthropology major in college. So the idea of learning about this culture, not my own, was pretty exciting. And I began in the way all academics begin. I began by reading, read everything I could get my hands on about the history of the Ojibwe. And I began meeting you know, folks in the Ojibwe community and forming relationships that have become friendships over these years. And so as I go forward in this series, I continue to do my research. I, I try to stay in touch with what's going on in Indian country to find out if there are issues that I need to talk about in my work. And I stay in touch with my friends in the community and, uh, and they are so helpful. Before deadlines, I will have at least one of my Ojibwe friends, usually two, read and vet my manuscripts to make sure that I haven't said anything that's too stupid or even worse, offensive. We're out of time this week, but you can keep up with our latest posts by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Visit the WDSE website for program updates, upcoming events, and more information about the station. And download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite PBS programs. And Denny, WDSC is receiving the Governor's Award at the Midwest Emmys in the Twin Cities this weekend for the COVID special that you hosted last winter. That's Congratulations. Right. Thank you very much. Our Greg Grell, who produced that program, uh, is also coming along as, as well as a number of others from the TV station. And uh, it's a great honor. So uh, we're it all is. pretty thrilled about it. It is. Congratulations. All right. Thank um, you so very much. Thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend.